thinking, are we on? I mean, what's happening? <laughs> Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT show. You know, it's been another great day for UK democracy. It seems, and many of you will have seen the pictures and the videos, that when MPs, or some of them, turned up at the House of Commons, they were in this enormous queue, this great line that extended right through the building and out into the sort of open air, and they had to wait in this long queue in order to vote. Extraordinary. It was only comparable with the queues the day before at IKEA. Of course, there's a huge difference between queuing in the House of Commons and queuing in IKEA. In the case of IKEA, you end up with a cabinet that possibly works. So there we are, a great day for UK democracy. My name is John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have yet another great guest for you tonight, and I'm really excited that she's able to join us. But first, a few words about TNT. TNT stands for The Nation Talks. So in many respects, this is your show. But I want to remind you, please, that this is only possible because of the great work that Indie Live and Indie Live Radio do, and they need your support. Please, this is not like the BBC. The BBC gets millions and millions of pounds from a poll tax. There is no poll tax that supports Indie Live. You support Indie Live. It, this is as much your show as it is anyone else's. I am merely a, 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 an instrument, a device, if you like, through which your views get known. And unlike the BBC, we don't edit it. This is live. So what you see is what you get, right? Where else could you get this? Fantastic. Support Indie Life, please. Go on the website, find out how to do it, and support them. And if you can do it on a continuous and continual basis, even better. So in many respects, this is your show. Right? Thanks in advance for any questions you've sent. But remember, this is live. You, you can contact us. You can write to me, at, if you like, prefer email, john at cliche.com. That's john at C, C for Charlie, L for Leo, E for, uh, e for Echo, I for India, S for Sugar, dot com. Shortest email address ever. And I've got my phone handy. We can take your, take your uh, questions live. Uh, also, there's other ways of contacting us. You'll see on the screen, there's a text number. By all means, use that. If you can access us from some other platform, do so. We're here. We'd love to hear your questions. This is your show. Now, by the way, you made a call in my Sunday National column. I challenged the BBC. I, I said to them, please come on the show and explain to people in Scotland why we should uh, trust your coverage. Now, so far, there's been no response. Uh, I guess they're still cowering in Pacific Key, uh, but the offer's still on the table. Now, to our guest this evening, Michelle Thompson. Michelle is a passionate and committed independence supporter, and she's been an SNP supporter since the very tender age of 16. Uh, she was also Managing Director of Business for Scotland during the 2014 uh, referendum, and I want to get this absolutely right, she, is, she was MP for uh, Edinburgh West from 2015 to 2017, and presently she runs Momentous Change with former colleague Professor Roger Mullen. Michelle, how are you? How are you coping with the pandemic? Well, I mean, I'm very well, and first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, on the show. Uh, I mean, I've been very fortunate during this pandemic, and I say that because none of my family or nearest and dearest friends uh, have been ill, just one, in fact. Uh, so anything, any small gripes and moans about, oh, I wish I could go and do this, I kind of stop myself and say, yeah, but I'm really, really so fortunate. And I've tried to get in a place at the forefront, all the people that are working so hard to make things better. You know, the key workers like my husband, for example, has carried on teaching. He's a school teacher. And of course, the NHS, which we've been doing the kind of clapathon every uh, Thursday. So, so far, so good. And whisper it, bits of it have actually been pretty enjoyable. I've had my um, two adult children home from university, plus my, my daughter's boyfriend. So actually, that's been pretty good. I don't know if they'd say that, but I <laughs> enjoyed that. Well, it, tell us a little bit about your background. I mean, <clears throat> you're uh, from a family of three, two, two brothers, is that right? Two that's older right. brothers. 
Uh, so you, you were the baby daughter of the family, is that right? Yeah, yeah. That, of course. And my brothers would say, that means I was spoiled. <laughs> uh, I suspect I was because I nearly died at 11 days old. I had, a, uh, I had to have an emergency operation. So that kind of made sure that only daughter nearly died. I think, I suspect I was. But uh, I grew up in uh, Mears Den outside Glasgow, uh, local school there, and went off to do a uh, music degree at what's now the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. I was a piano player and uh, taught for a while, worked in a, in a theatre, uh, conducting and composing music for a rec company. And then I went off and did another qualification in IT and ended up spending many, many years in financial services, being a project manager, a program manager, a sort of delivery manager, you know, lots of different experience. Then left that, um, um, I set up my own property company, which I ran for a couple of years. Then got involved in the independence referendum. And really, uh, uh, that has been quite an all-consuming passion, to be honest. How did uh, you find the referendum? How was the referendum for you? I mean, I know we were all disappointed by the outcome. Yeah. But, but, but you were right in the middle of the, the machine, as it were. What was your impression of it? Was it well, well I mean, how did it work? It's quite interesting because one of the comments I often make about it, and it's funny how no experience in your life is ever wasted. And at the start of the referendum, I know that there was quite a bit of frustration because the Yes campaign, I mean, which I wasn't involved in that, took quite a bit of time to get its act together, to be honest. And I imagined at the time they were developing a kind of framework, right, this is, these are the key messages, this is what how we want you to roll it out, here's some sample leaflets and so on. But it took so long to get that together that yes, groups were springing up all over Scotland and basically said, we well, you know what, we don't want to hang around, wait, we're going to go and do ourselves. And that, that was quite a benefit because what it meant was that People were organising their own groups and talking and really what they call in the kind of, um, you know, business terminology, visioning about what an independent Scotland could look like and what it could feel like and what it meant for the people who were in the, in the audience. And I think that was a huge benefit. And the analogy I used at the time was when you say to your kids, I've hidden your Christmas presents in that cupboard and you're not allowed to look. Of course, your average normal child is going to open the door and take a peep and they'll see the kind of glistening baubles there. And even if they slam the door shut, the promise of what's behind there is imprinted on their retina and imprinted in their brain. And I think for many people, that's what happened for the first time they could say, imagine if this could be possible. So even though the result didn't go our way, I think it fundamentally changed the way people felt about independence. And for me personally, it was uh, an uplifting and sometimes terrifying uh, experience. Um, you know, I mean, I ended up doing quite a bit of media and uh, they seemed to get, you know, more like live ones on Sky and so on. And, and I mean, that's really quite risky because, to be honest, and I understand how politicians feel, for example, Nicola's doing this all the time. She's highly skilled in it. But how they feel doing that, because if you mess up, you don't just mess up for you. You mess up for everybody else. And I was very, very aware of that. But most of all, it was the passion. You know, I'm, I made friends then that. I still have today uh, and, and we're unified by not just a political outcome that we both want I think we're unified by a set of shared values that we both believe that if it's going to be it's up to us to do something about it so ultimately very positive I have to say. I, I, I personally I had mixed feelings <clears throat> I, I was concerned first of all I, I, I remember going to visit the people at the Yes campaign and we had a meeting for business people and we did this round the table discussion and I was asked how I felt about it and I said well my concern is that the Yes campaign is irredeemably positive. I mean that, that, that sounds like a major plus but I felt that you had to go negative at some stage and I asked uh, 
for the simple reason that people, ex it's a bit like playing golf with only one club. You know, you, you've got to have more in your, your bag than just one club. And it's a great club, don't get me wrong, but it's not going to do everything for you. Uh, and I asked, so what is the plan? If they go negative, really negative, what, what are you going to do? And they said, well, we'll, we'll have a think about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. Uh, and what really brought it home to me, and the reason it prompted that question, is I'd gone canvassing around the local pensioner community because I'm that age. You know, I, they don't find me off-putting because they think, well, you, you, you look a bit like a sort of faded Dustin Hoffman. You can't be terribly terribly uh, disconcerting. And, and, and you would come to the door and I would say, have you thought about this? Oh, yeah, I think it's a great idea, independence. But my MP has just called and said, you know, if you vote for independence, we're going to stop your pension. And, and I can't afford for my pension to be stopped. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that was the reality. Hey, we've had a, a question from David Mack on Facebook. Um, I wonder <clears throat> when the Tories are shouting about Corona-19 virus and our First Minister, how do they think Boris is doing? Uh, there's a mixture of things there. I think maybe it might mean for, uh, Prime Minister. But, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, how do they think Boris is doing? How do you think Boris is doing? <laughs> That's a question. I'm trying to be polite. You know, it's too early in the show to be rude. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, he comes, he likes to adopt this persona, and it is a persona of a bumbling buffoon. And people kind of go, oh, well, you know, that's just Boris. That's just what he does. In my view, he is a deeply conniving man. He is a prize, a schemer to get what he wants. So I almost believe there's something sinister about how he operates. Uh, I don't believe the bumbling buffoon. You don't end up in that position by being that way. Um, so, of course, he's doing incredibly badly. But logically, which is what we all tend to do, we say, well, look at this guy. I mean, how can you support this guy? But we're not talking about necessarily rational feelings. People will continue to create excuses for how poorly he presents because there's some other agenda going on. He's tapping into some fear or some belief and so on for many people, uh, particularly in England, particularly around the Brexit thing, where they, they link it to some things they're in favour of. So, uh, of course, I've got a very dim view of him, but I also think he is deeply dangerous and his cabal around him are highly dangerous. It's my belief belief, to be honest, that they may want to try and adopt their scorched earth policy uh, in Scotland. I mean, if you look at the lack of communication with the devolved institutions, not just the, the Scottish government, the damage that, you know, will be done to Scotland's economy if there's not a transition, I mean, it's deeply significant and, you know, underestimate him and believe this bumbling buffoonery at your peril. Yeah, I agree. And of course, <clears throat> you can talk with real experience because you actually spent yeah. some time there as an MP. What did yeah. you think of uh, operating at Westminster, not just as uh, an SNP MP, but as a woman? I mean, uh -huh. what was your impression of, I mean, I have to tell you, when I was there, one of, one of my thoughts was, uh, at a very basic level, uh, it smelled. <laughs> And there's another way to put this, you know. I would yeah, go down to the, there's a bar downstairs. I can't remember what it's called now. And, oh um, yes. <laughs> and it, and it, oh, you know, yeah, there's several bars. Uh, yeah, down, and down in the bowels, if you can excuse the term. And it, it, it felt a bit like that. You were down in the intestines. What was your impression of working there? Right. Well, I mean, again, there's always positives and negatives of everything. So behind the the front facing element. There's an army of civil servants that work very hard in trying circumstances to provide a good service to MPs. Uh, MPs themselves, regardless of their political party, we, we, you know, we'll conventionally say, oh, we don't like the Tories. There's no such thing as the Tories. There are some really just terrible people and there are some people there who really struggle under the whip and what they're forced to do. And sometimes they're ignorant because frankly, they don't get out enough. Uh, so you do meet nice people regardless of their political party. 
the select committees, I mean, I was very fortunate to be in the business select committee and sometimes it can vary but the chair was very unifying it was all about getting the job done we did some good work with like calling Sir Philip Green to account uh, Sports Direct uh, the, the issues with using agencies workers, workers and often they were very good however it's the way they do their politics that is the issue they make a virtual virtue about out of all about the kind of fighting and the swords length in the chamber you've got two sword lengths between the two opposing sides and your comment about being a woman I always felt that it was quite a bullying culture at the time now nobody bullied me but to be honest you know I grew up outside Glasgow I'm the kind of girl that would say can you even say that <laughs> and you know I never never really had any issues and sometimes people bully you. So, sorry, the bullying from obviously it wasn't from the officials. Could you have a very high regard for the officials there? Yeah. So the bullying must come from other politicians. Is that right? Well, for example, um, I remember uh, Tasmina Ahmed Sheikh used to be subjected to the most outrageous jeering in the chamber. Uh, and I remember it was Nicholas Soam said something particularly rude to her, which you just think that is disgusting. I mean, there was no need for that. It was really, really poor. And when you're watching it on telly, people can mouth things and their colleagues around them will laugh and jeer, but it's not picked up in the, in the telly. And that kind of behaviour, I think, is, is disgraceful. Uh, and I've got no time for it. You know, at the end of the day, we all have our views and we all have our politics. And I think if we can't conduct our debates in mutual respect, even though you may absolutely totally disagree with them then there's something a bit lost but they make a virtue out of that and of course as we've seen and you alluded to in your opening piece they make a virtue out of make of adding no progress whatsoever i remember how excited they were when they introduced a voting system that the tellers when you go through the lobbies in normal times instead of ticking your name off with a pencil on a piece of paper that they did a kind of virtual tick on an iPad. And that was hailed as, yes, you know, we're using the technology. Well, oh, goodness sake, guys, get with the program. Have you seen what's happening with technology? And then, of course, they've reverted by not allowing people to, to vote remotely and the, the, the kind of associated impact on democracy. So they make a virtue out of looking backwards and mm -hmm. inwards run forwards and outwards so it's quite frankly in the dark ages as a legislature yeah. um, but uh, pluses and minuses uh, but you know I would say don't forget that there's good people working hard reg regardless of their politics. They, they do some seems to have an enormous penchant for uh, the odd and the bizarre I mean is it true that all acts have to be committed on vellum uh, and I was the, the, yeah. the, 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 the it, and they're written down in is it, they're written down in some form of Anglo French of some kind. So somebody, <laughs> has to, somebody has to dig out this vellum from somewhere, and somebody else who's an expert in sort of odd French has to translate from English into French before. It, is that true? Is that? I mean, there's certainly, I don't know about the language thing, but certainly it's true about the, the vellum, and they've got a whole range of quaint. Uh, um, kind of uh, set of, of habits like that. They've got a whole range of, and in fact, the whole kind of bowing and scraping and all the rest of it, it's all very, it's all very bizarre. Uh, you know, um, but I suppose mainly for me, it's the lack of democracy. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's slipping every, back, every way backwards. It can't really be considered a proper functioning democratic system and that is really that's a huge concern for everybody across the UK not just us in Scotland and it won't serve any of us you know it's taking us backwards but of course that's I believe that's what the Tories want. Yeah I, I suspect that, that was, I mean uh, there seems to be a huge comfort level with things staying as they are uh, and even modest reforms seem to take forever and ever unless there's some national crisis that accompanies them and somehow that gives it license in order to happen. We've had another question come in um, from Robert Knight, uh, who's uh, on Facebook. 
And he says there's quite a lot of frustration at the lack of rebuttals against the opposition smears that occur daily. What, what are your thoughts on this, this deficit of uh, uh, rebuttal? I mean, being honest, I'm not entirely sure that uh, the SNP group in Westminster at this present time has found its feet in the way uh, in the way that the groups did in 2015 and 2017. The game has fundamentally changed. It's fundamentally changed because you've got this whopping great majority of Tories determined, in fact, hell-bent, I would suggest, to take us, make us crash out of Europe and result in damage to Scotland. It's taken them a wee while, uh, and I hope Ian Blackford won't mind me saying this, to get the, the MPs to really focus on what's absolutely important. Take, for example, uh, in the last parliament where the SNP MPs walked out, I think it was a slight against Joanna Cherry, although I forget the exact circumstances. Now, for the people here, people were delighted to see that. They were saying, yeah, good on you. This is the sort of thing we need to see. And I know, I think it was George Caravan had, I mean, I don't know how serious George was, but he was saying, well, maybe we should be, you know, demonstrating and tubes and all the rest of it. And again, I'm not going to express a view on that, but that kind of uh, eye-catching thing to really make it real, because sometimes people don't necessarily respond to the uh, he said, she said thing. And keeping doing the same thing isn't necessarily going to work going forward. So I have some sympathy with your uh, previous question. It's, you know, horses for courses, if you like. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a question that comes up all the time, and you must have faced it when you were an MP there, which is basically this. Uh, since you're treated so very badly down there, why don't you all just come home mm. and, and well, set up a convention here, and then you don't have to take the dog's abuse that that people like Ian Blackford get exposed to almost yeah. every time he's at Prime Minister's questions. Right, well, okay. Okay, on that, um, I would have no sympathy for Ian and I would have no sympathy for me and I would have no sympathy for Tasmina and so on in one way. Now, I'm not at any point saying that that level of abuse is acceptable, but what I am saying is that all the actions of our MPs our MSPs, our councillors must lead in some way to changing Scotland and changing Scotland so that she has the confidence in the next independence of referendum to vote yes. As Jim Mather used to call it, keeping focused on the North Star. So the question is, therefore, would it, on balance, all things considered, give a better outcome to get us to that point if all our MPs left and came up the road. And then we get back into this discussion again about what are the best convincer strategies for people who are not yet at the point of voting yes. And on that measure, I'm not necessarily convinced it would be the right thing to do. It would make our guys feel happy, but would it get people over the line? So I wouldn't see it happening because of a bit of argy-bargy. Let's face it, you know, you have to learn to give as good as, your, uh, as you can get. And I don't mean in a disrespectful way through mm. skills of your debating. Uh, but everything for me is determined by what will get us to yes, what will build a better Scotland. And some people would view it. And of course, the media would portray it that way, an abrogation of responsibility by Scottish SNP MPs. I, they would say, I assume that you were elected to represent your constituents yeah. First and I foremost, yes. and how can you do that? If you're not Doing there. That. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and we and I mean, some people say, ah, but look at Sinn Fein and in Ireland. But the circumstances are where certainly when they made the decision about doing that, were completely different at that time. Do you think there might be a connection between that possibility, i.e., of? Uh, I mean, I've been interested that it's possible to uh, to conduct the business remotely. The pandemic has shown us that, that, that yeah. works. And we know it continues to work because the House of Lords, I gather, is mm -hmm. continuing with the remote voting yeah. process. So it's only been... Even the Lords are further ahead than the Commons. Well, well there's an irony for you, isn't it? Heavens oh. above. So a whole bunch of unelected people uh, can use technology, but apparently the elected 
uh, can't any any longer, uh, according to Rhys Mogg's decision. Uh, but maybe what motivated that decision uh, to abandon remote voting was the strong possibility that SNP members could have their cake and eat it. <laughs> I they could be they could be in Scotland representing a, a constitutional view, collectively perhaps, and at the same time be handling constituency business. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. strictly speaking, I suppose, maybe you, and I'd love to know if you agree or disagree with this, uh, it might be possible to, if, with, with remote uh, connections of the kind that we saw working recently, to conduct a whole bunch of business mm -hmm. from home, as it were. Yeah. Uh, without the expense of uh, paying for people to go to London, to stay in London, uh, to vote in London occasionally. Uh, and uh, so what's your view on that? I mean, it, do you think it may be possible to do a lot of business from, from one's home as a constituency MP? Or one's constituency office? Well, yeah, of course. And that's the thing. If you look at any other area of life that has had to kind of muddle through in one way or another with remote work and getting people up to speed with the technology and so on, and for some people that's been been difficult and, and trying. And you know, if you think about like, social workers, for example, how on earth do they you know get in front of people when it's it's via Zoom, for example? So, in my view, there are very few sectors that will go back exactly to the way things were. Some people have used the terminology, the, the new normal. And I think it's ridiculous that Westminster has almost immediately sought to go back to exactly the way th things were. So uh, I think that's highly disappointing. And I see no reason why a lot more ordinary business could not be done remotely. It's completely ridiculous to suggest otherwise. And if you think about it from a democracy point of view, the closer the representative is to the people that elected him or her, the better. Because there is a sense, and whisper it, it's some MPs will go off to London and have quite a fine time. Yeah. London is a great city. It's a wonderful place. Yeah. And there's always lots of lots going on there's lots of intrigue and gossip and all the rest of it now that's great fun but it's not getting the job done so i think it has to start to get with the times okay well here, here's a here's a uh, an associated point that, that has come from uh, sharon gallagher on facebook thanks sharon for getting getting through with your question she says and I'd like your view on this, and maybe you're in a better position to answer this than people who are actually embedded right now. Should all the opposition MPs have stood in solidarity yesterday and boycotted returning to Parliament to highlight the absurdity of not being able to vote remotely? Yes. <laughs> so if you've been asked that question, you would have said, let's yeah. organise a boycott. Yeah, uh -huh. and I hope this isn't going to appear in the front page of the Daily Mail or anything like that. In fact, I'm emphatically saying yes. Now, I, of course, I'm being slightly facetious. I imagine it was a difficult balancing call for uh, Ian Blackford to make. You know, he's making decisions like that all the time. But on balance, all things considered, I would say yes. And it's not just because of what it means, the fact that uh, Nicola Sturgeon has made the Scottish position on behalf of the Scottish people you know, let's remember that very, very clear. It's the fact also it can only be considered an outrage that so many groups of people, people who are shielding or their relatives are shielding or if they're disabled, have been effectively disenfranchised. I actually think it would have been a virtue pointing that out as well, because again, that's slipping back into the dark ages. Now, I'm sure it was a difficult call, but my own personal view is that they should have stayed away and made a point of it because nobody is suggesting throughout this crisis that any leader has done everything perfectly and all correct. And I'm sure there'll be questions of the Scottish government and quite rightly so. But yeah. I think uh, Nicola Sturgeon has put the health of the Scottish people front and centre of what she's trying to do. And she's made that quite clear. And it's on that basis I, I agree with, with that question. I would say yes. 
Okay, good point, good point. Uh, we've had a question from uh, Suzanne Campbell Creighton on Facebook about uh, a constitution, and perhaps we'll come back to that in a second for Scotland. But there's a question here, uh, uh, which I think you might want to tackle just now. It's from Ray Crofter on Facebook, and he says, the opposition to independence in a future referendum would have nothing new to offer in relation to Project Fear 2. He wants to know how you would anticipate the Scottish business sector giving greater credible support uh, following all the engagement that's been going on for, by Business for Scotland and Momentous Change and others since 2014. Okay, I mean, that's, that's a big question. Again, is there enough discussion and engagement with business? Is there enough of an understanding as what business means for us? I used to argue during the first independence referendum that people had a very jaded view of business. They imagined it was a kind of large corporates. You know, if you look at the way Philip Green behaved with BHS, offshore tax havens and so on. And I was always at pains to point out that certainly whatever the figure was then and what it is now, certainly over 99% of Scotland's businesses are small, medium enterprises. And of that, a huge percentage of them are micro businesses, just people working on their own in their offices. And if you think about voice and, and influence and voting, the little guy and the small companies, each one of them has an individual vote. Whereas these large corporations who were coming out against uh, independence, of course, they were often headquartered in London, certainly carried the airwaves much more than they should have done. And it was for that reason I felt it was vitally important that we were engaging with, all of the time, small business owners. Uh, and I think Business for Scotland at that time tried to put that, that uh, voice across, and, and I think it still does so successfully now. Then we look at what's happening in COVID-19, and with the fallout from that would be, and it becomes clear to me, is even more important that we're engaging with these small business owners. And of course, haven't we all suddenly realised the value? You know, we've got a wee local shop, a wee local spa up in Fruhi, where I now live. And the people who work there have put in a shift they are the backbone of the community. They're the one that's delivering food to the to the you know, old person who can get out. They have been remarkable. And every little village and town and streets will have similar stories of, the, of these people. So they are the businesses we want to be engaging with. The large corporates, they're global. Guess, you know, they'll move their tax haven from place to place if yeah. they can make some money out of it. So it's not quite as simple to say it's about business. Now, in terms of Project Fear 2, is there enough activity going on just now to engage with people in Scotland? I'm not entirely sure. And this is where the Yes campaign, I've always said, is complementary to the SNP. The SNP is a political vehicle, but by necessity, it's a short-term thing because there's a political cycle. If they want to be in power, they need to roll with a political cycle. And that's the way it is, and that's the way it is for any political party. The Yes campaign has a vitally important role. And to be honest, I think the Yes campaign should be starting now. I think there's nothing to stop some good brains putting a structure in place and helping to unify the yes groups and getting more activity on the ground. We should be starting that now. Arguably, maybe we should never uh, have stopped. And one of the projects that uh, Roger Mullen and I have started to think about is a kind of visioning project, if you like, imagine Scotland, imagine Scotland as a better place and getting those conversations going again about what we would like to see, the what, what it means to people, what it would mean for their children and their grandchildren, not just the how. Because what we've learned, if you look at the election of Trump, if you look at Brexit, where was the white paper? Remember, everyone's quoting this, that you could drop that white paper in your toes and break your pinky toe, you know? And yet people didn't have that for Brexit. They voted for different reasons. So the question and the challenge for me is, are we doing enough to engage with people and to help them think in a creative and different way of what's possible for 
Scotland? And the answer I would say to that at this point is we're not doing enough. That's very interesting. You might be interested in this, I gather, and I hope I'm not talking out of turn here, but maybe Indie Life have got some plans about how to help better connect the yes groups who are busy beavering away out there just now. But I won't say any more about that because I don't want to steal uh, Kevin's thunder. Yeah. The question has come in from John Lynch on YouTube. And he's, uh, he's saying, Michelle, would you be in favour of a breakdown in care homeowners, uh, the privately run versus the council run? Oh, right. Now, I mean, there's clearly been some issues here. Um, I mean, we saw um, Tony Banks, who runs the Balhousie Care Group, talking the other day and, and kind of, in his view, calling out the Scottish government. But there's clearly more information to be gained and a debate to be had about the obligations of private businesses to manage their own personal risks. Right. So when COVID-19 came along as a pandemic, it was obvious to even people who weren't in that sector that there would be certain locations and critical masses where the risks would be greater. So I do, I mean, I don't carry as quite as much sympathy for care home operators who weren't necessarily as well equipped as they could have been. I don't carry the same sympathy. That said, and I'd like to be quite clear, I carry huge sympathy for families who put their, their hope and their trust and their faith in the care in the care homes where they've put their loved ones. That's a terrible position to be in. Uh, but I do think that private operators need to look at themselves. That said, there have been considerable challenges with getting the, the PPE equipment that's been required, and that's been the case for both the public care homes, the runs, ones run by local councils as well as the private ones as well, despite their best efforts. And I think the lack of available PPE will be something that's looked at because, of course, we didn't have a huge kind of like pile of PPE. And then as the pandemic came along, well, everybody across the world, every state, every country was looking to try and source it. So I'm also qualifying it by saying, well, it's not that they were completely asleep in the job, but it's clearly an area that's going to have to be looked at. And private care homes generally, and so obviously there's talk today about uh, a kind of national care service. Uh, yeah, and again, that, you know, from a, a social policy point of view, all of us would want and hope that our, our old people who have given so much to our community are well looked after. But then the other part of me also says, yeah, but wait a minute, we know that the, the, the kind of age profile of our society, we're going to have more and more old people. How will we be able to do that? I mean, and you do need to look at the numbers as well. So I, I think it's good that the idea is being floated. I think that, that is certainly worth looking at, uh, but it will need careful consideration. Okay. And we still got the question outstanding about the Constitution, but again, if uh, I may be forgiven, I'll come back to that. We've had a, a question from uh, somebody called Roger Mullen. Who, <laughs> who, no, what do you hear from him? Michelle is part of a very musical family. What is her view regarding the importance of the arts and culture to Scotland's future? It's absolutely fundamental. Here's an, here's an example. My son uh, is in his fourth year at a music conservatoire. That's his final year. Now, he's doing a, a performing degree in the trumpet. In fact, I think I just heard him starting to play there. He doesn't know I'm doing this, obviously. And because of uh, COVID-19, he is unable to do his uh, final recital in the way that it would originally be structured. That is, it's about a 50-minute recital with a professional accompanist in front of a panel of the top trumpeters drawn from all the top orchestras in a theatre with all his friends, open to the public and his family there, incredibly high pressure. But it's the very essence of performing. When you're performing in a musical instrument, it's not just the dots roughly in the right order. It's absolutely fundamentally giving of yourself. You are speaking through your instrument and there can't be anything more creative and there can't be anything more that is part of, of the culture 
of our society. It's a mark of a civilized society, all the performing arts. And I, I am very, very fearful of what the crisis is going to do to people's jobs. Will, will my son be able to work in music? I very much doubt it. He is already starting to consider that after four years, he's not going to be able to do what he studied for years and years for. But there's many, many people like that, people who are currently working in the industry. And it's so vital. And I think we should never forget that. And I understand we're always under financial constraints. There's always calls to stop uh, instrumental tuition in schools, for example. But I was that geeky kid. To be honest, I didn't really have a lot of friends. And music was a bit of a saviour for me and an outlet for me to express myself. And we can't forget these things. It's really, really important. So thank you, Roger, for that question. <laughs> thank you for that answer. <laughs> uh, the Constitution, mm. because, uh, the, the question that was put, uh, it's an interesting one, and uh, it's one that I feel personally strongly about, but it would be interesting and your take is from, again, from Suzanne Campbell Creighton on Facebook. And she said, are we any further forward with the Scottish government adopting a constitution? I mean, the honest answer to that is I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the latest position is uh, on that. I mean, I know what they're doing with the citizens' assemblies, for example. But in terms of the constitution, I'm not entirely sure of that answer. Uh, I did tweet the other day uh, that we we should do it. You know, if, for example, there's been a delay, there again is nothing to stop us. I mean, if you think about it logically, why would the Scottish government write the constitution? Yeah. I'm not saying that they don't have an important role in adopting it, in enshrining it, in giving it legitimacy through the Scottish Parliament. But there's a lot more we can be doing. It. And I'm a bit concerned that what's happening in Scotland at the moment is we're, we're quite passive. We're not actors in the journey. Some people say, why isn't the government doing this? Well, the government doesn't need to do it. And I mean, you mentioned Elliot Boomer, who is an expert, a recognised expert. You know, we could get a group of people together and say, right, we are going to create at least a framework that would frame out in some way a constitution. What are the key values by which people in Scotland choose to live? And there's lots of lots of examples around the world where other people have developed constitutions. So I'm sorry I don't know the answer to that. I'm not always across absolutely everything that this Maybe somebody in the Scottish government who's watching this can give us an answer, because I'd love to hear it too. Michelle, you should have known that, but no, I don't know, and I'm sorry I don't know the answer to that. Here's a question. You've talked with enormous passion about music and the arts, and we've touched upon technology. Uh, your love of Scotland has shone through, but I sense too that you have a deep commitment to young people mm -hmm. and mentoring and helping people to blossom and to grow and develop. Yeah, I, I um, as a sort of sideline, um, mentor young women. I've always done that, probably for about 20 years. And the reason I've done that is, well, why women? It's not just because I, I am a woman, it's the fact that all the evidence tells us that it is harder for women to make their way in, in the world. There's a whole variety of things that operate. There's institutional misogyny, you know, I mean, and that we've talked about Westminster, for example. Uh, and of course, we've seen this COVID crisis that it's actually women that have been, been hit. So, you know, the care workers, the social workers and so on, mostly tend to be women. Um, but also, I think I've got a duty to give back to young people. I think all of us have, once we're past a certain age, I probably started it when I was about 30, because as people help us when we are young, so we must return and do that. And I've always done it for nothing as well. And so people sometimes say to me, what can I give you for this? And I always make them promise that they'll do the same when they get to a certain stage in their life. My view of young people at the moment, I mean, they're there's some very, very difficult times ahead. You know, if you look at, I expect that unemployment 
uh, there'll be greater unemployment as a result of the, the pandemic. It's so difficult for people to get the kind of secure jobs where they can grow and learn and develop and, and you know, bring up their family and so on. It's so much harder. But one thing I always say to young women is to really dig into that sense and try and develop confidence. And I don't mean kind of certainly not arrogance, but quiet confidence, because all all the evidence tells us that women will consistently undersell and underplay what they have to offer. And actually, young men will consistently oversell and overplay uh, what they have to offer. So I always say to them, you know, you must be confident. Don't be afraid to try. And even though all of us sometimes fail, and I kind of laugh about my career and say that it's been made up of of a, quite a succession of failures. <laughs> I've done different things and I've been, I've been, you know, relatively successful in some of them and really not very good in other ones at all. Uh, and the other thing I would sort of say to them is, is about resilience. Don't overestimate resilience. There's an awful lot to be said for getting up every day and getting on with it. And if you think about the long distance runner, I remember, I forget the chap's name, uh, but he was asked in an interview how he managed to do these long distance runs. And he said, he was quite puzzled by the question. He said, Ah, oh, I don't know. I just keep putting one foot in front of the other. <laughs> and I thought that was actually a pretty good metaphor for life, really. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Be resilient, be confident, work hard and be prepared to take a chance. You know? I think that's good advice. You know, I'm always reminded of the, the there was a fantastic um, American football coach who ran the Green Bay Packers, which is located in a way out of the way uh, the, uh, location in the States, but they consistently won. And the few occasions when they lost, his answer was, you know, from the media, why did you lose? And he said, we didn't lose, we just ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you, I mean, that's <laughs> like, like, yeah. picked that up uh, at some stage later. Uh, but he, he was noted for, for, for it, it was always positive. And, mm -hmm. Uh, it was it was sometimes misunderstood as uh, audacity, but it, and it was a mixture of both. Yeah. It, was, it was about audacity and persistence. Uh, yeah. And it, it, I mean, I spent a long time in the states, and that was one of the impressions I formed fairly early on, was that Americans had no, uh, not all, but a lot of Americans I met had no real issue with what we deem as failure. They, they, they took that as that that's what happens in life you know and if that's what happens in your business life that means it's it, it's a similar sort of pattern you don't it's not a question of uh, falling over how, how many times you fall over it's how many times you get up yeah absolutely that, that combination of audacity and, and commitment uh life is a funny way of happening to all of us uh you know in one way or another and it's you know, it's not what happens to you, uh, it's how you you choose to deal with it. And, and I suppose in some respects, I mean, I've certainly had some trying times. Uh, it wasn't, the, my, my stint as an MP certainly wasn't the easiest time in my life. But uh, in reality, uh, the view I took was that I could choose how to respond to a set of circumstances and keep putting the choice back to myself. And I kind of made a decision that I was I wanted to behave in a certain way that looking back years down the line I could look back with with pride and I'm not saying that wasn't that wasn't always easy were there days where I was pretty miffed yeah there certainly was was there days where I felt like I could just pull the duvet over my head well of course there were I'm only a human being uh, but you know here I am and on on balance I'm optimistic and I'm hopeful and I want to play my part in helping shape a better future for Scotland, my own small part. And who would have thought that in 2015? You know, it was a bit uh, tumultuous, but, but here you go. You know, but it's because maybe, I think for me, this was something I absolutely believe fundamentally that independence, self-determination is the term I prefer, is so important for Scotland. When we see what's happening now, I am in despair with, with Brexit, 
and Boris Johnson, and I've never been more determined. And maybe that's because I always believed in it. So a bit of Harley Burley, you know, a bit of politics. Oh, yeah. um, I ain't going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to know. And I, I take it your advice to young people, perhaps young women in particular, is that you don't need permission from anyone yeah. uh, to be a success, uh, to do what you want to do. Uh, because I guess if you're constantly seeking permission, somehow you're assigning to somebody else control over your life uh, when it's really you. It's you well, that controls your life at the end of the day. Uh, if you're always trying to make everybody else happy, well, th there's so many different kind of chattering classes, none of them will be happy. You certainly won't be happy. You know, so you really have to uh, go after something you're passionate about. I've got three passions, young people, music, and Scotland, and yeah. all of the activity I do, whether it's in my personal life or whether it's in my working life, I try and make things better in each one of these areas. And that yeah. actually makes things a lot easier. So definitely, you know, don't try and keep everybody uh, happy. And incidentally, I can absolutely confirm as a kind of politician for a while, there is no way in God's earth you'll keep everybody happy. <laughs> it comes to the territory. It's just the way it is. So it's not just a question of having broad shoulders. You have to have a thick, a thick hide and a constitution to cope with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and that's the way it is, you know. <laughs> uh, we don't have time to take the question from Bill Hosey, but thank you, Bill for, for uh, writing in. <clears throat> uh, and also, uh, we don't have time for Kizzy Wiz either on Periscope, uh, but perhaps we'll come back to these at uh, another uh, show. But there's a question for Roddy McNeil on Facebook, and he says, thanks for your uh, interview, he says. He says, can Michelle suggest how Scotland can obtain freedom from Scot uh, London's strict broadcasting control laws, which currently prevent good folk like Independence Live uh, from broadcasting more widely. I'm not, I'm not sure that the BBC prevents that, but, uh, but what do you think can be done about broadcasting? Because so many people are very upset about the, particularly the BBC news coverage. Yeah, right. So, I mean, I would suggest a guest for your uh, programme, a chap called Luke McCulloch, who is BBC Scotland's sort of public affairs representative in Westminster. Now, he won't thank me for suggesting that, I'm sure. Um, but the BBC is an institution, and I don't necessarily hold to the idea that, you know, people are maliciously setting out to mis misrepresent. It's an institution, and there are flaws in every institution. It thinks like an institution, and it changes very, very slowly, like an institution does. Within the BBC itself, there are a great and I can tell you this, there are a great many people who are yes voters, who, who are active and positive about independence for Scotland, who have to work within this institution that isn't able to see itself as others see it. The other issue, which is much more fundamental, is that the BBC headquarters, the big boss, is in London. And of course, the chattering there is all a London-centric view. It took them long enough to re realise that there were other places in the UK. You know, remember the way you used to speak with bulls in their mouth uh, when I was growing up? You know, it was like, oh, we could have regional accents. It took them years to realise that. Again, it sounds a bit trite and I don't mean it to be so, but again, broadcasting and how we hear our voices in broadcasting is one of the ways that by Scotland being independent and having control over its output so that all our voices are heard, it, it, that is one of the critical reasons for independence. We ain't going to change the BBC very fast. The BBC is the BBC, and if anything, I see it sliding slightly backwards with Boris Johnson's law really clearly influencing it. So it's more complex as a situation than people imagine. There's a lot of good people working the BBC, but as an institution, it's failing to change at the rate we need it. It ain't going to do it for us. So yeah. get back out campaigning. Would, would you be in favour of a Scottish broadcasting corporation with democratic oversight of broadcasting in Scotland? Yeah. It's a good question, isn't it? Um, would I, on balance, I can see the benefits of it. 
as long as there are sufficient controls, because what I've said about what the Tories are doing with the BBC in London, I mean, I could be speaking out of turn in that, but that's what, what I believe. Uh, you do need to have sufficient controls that the government of the day isn't vesting too much in influence over the institution. The converse to that, to have a kind of commercial market, well then, would you then have globalised companies that are paying big bucks to try and make people think this in a certain way? And that, I think, is probably above my pay grade to answer that one correctly because it's quite a complex issue to address and there are many countries that are looking at what is the best model. Uh, you know, and if you ask every broadcaster, they all have different views about that. What's the right answer? I don't know, uh, but we certainly need to start thinking about that. Yeah, and I, and I think there's some onus on broadcasters to become more involved in this discussion. I mean, I look at uh, more recent opinion polls in which people are asked how which uh, sort of broadcasting or newspaper organisation do you trust? And the, f the figures are appalling. I mean, they're just, and they're, and they're dropping like a stone almost in some areas with a, an impact on circulation. If we can go back to the old days when newspapers circulated as opposed to most of them are online now yeah. uh, and probably make most of their money from their online uh, uh, access. But, you know, it, it, it does seem to me that, and I don't detect it anywhere, and I hope maybe that's my fault rather than the fault of the broadcasters or newspapers generally or journalists generally particularly editors is that I don't see anyone anywhere saying let's engage in this discussion about the future of broadcasting I don't see it coming from that quarter I see it coming from pretty much every other quarter but what I see and I hope I'm wrong in this is a sense of a, a sort of small group of people feeling very sort of threatened by the whole thing and I was here we are the broadcasters and we're being attacked yet again isn't this scandalous? And I think, well, hey, I'm not sure it's scandalous. I think it's perfectly natural for people to say, as a consumer, I don't like the product. Now, as business people, we know if your customer says to you, I don't like the product, you should prick up your ears <laughs> because they won't tell you that too often. <laughs> They'll go somewhere else. And uh, in a sense, that's what's happening with Indie Live and, and the other uh, 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 operations because it's, that's a natural development that people make if they don't get the service they feel that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And I think that particularly applies to the BBC because the BBC operates on a poll tax. So one has uh, an, a, a relationship with a newspaper, which is based on, if I don't like what you say, I won't buy the, the darn thing. That's not the case with the BBC. So I think as an obligation, more than newspapers do, to come out and say, this is, this is the environment I'm in, these are the challenges I have, and this is how I see my future and not leave it to other people to constantly nag at them and say, how do you see your future? Yeah, I mean, they're not, they're not changing fast enough. They have made some changes, but they're not just not changing fast enough. And, of course, we know that, that the money raised in Scotland through licence fees isn't spent, you know, in a direct set, 8.3% of our population share isn't spent in Scotland. So that's an issue as well. But actually, the fundamental, fundamental issue is one of control and particularly editorial control and we've seen some pretty poor examples uh, of that so the BBC doesn't have its troubles to see it needs to change but it is an institution and it takes a long time to change institutions believe me I used to work in that when I was in uh, <laughs> life you know even with the best world in the world it takes a long time but it is a good big debate to have about what to we want to see and I mean obviously I saw your first program you, you you had Richard Walker on we're not even necessarily in the right position what we've got is you know um, a whole range of papers and we've got the national that's sort of taking one view actually the Scottish government you need a media that holds power to account that holds the Scottish government to uh, account I'm threatened yeah. by that we actually need a healthy media that is challenging everything so I know it sounds it's ironic for me to say, but I am a firm believer in a challenging media for us all because it holds power to account. It's absolutely vital whether we like it or not. So that's another consideration to throw into the melting pot oh, in Scotland. It won't serve us, you know, whatever type of government we have, uh, you know, even if it, they, they are massively popular, if they're not held to account, it's just not good for democracy. I mean, I agree. Michelle, our time is almost up. 
Well, you, you've been a great interviewee, uh, sparing your blushes. It's been uh, well, excellent. Yeah. I've, I've enjoyed it. I hope others have enjoyed it too, tuning in. Uh, you've been passionate, erudite, articulate, and from time to time audacious, which is fantastic. And, uh, and a big thank you. Words. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a big thank you to all of you out there who've uh, joined us tonight. I hope you enjoyed the show. We have a formidable list of guests uh, for future shows. Uh, don't miss next week when we have Professor Joe Goldblatt, uh, mm -hmm. who's joining us. Uh, you you sh don't really want to miss this. Uh, you'll find out how a guy from Dallas, Texas, ended up as an emeritus professor in Scotland. Uh, now, I hope that's whetted your appetite. Join us next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for another exciting show. And again, please note the change of date. We're on on Wednesdays and not Tuesdays. Uh, in the meantime, do look out for my Constitution column in the Sunday National this weekend. And again, this is hugely important. Do support Indie Live and Indie Live Radio. New voices for a new Scotland. And if you like the TNT show, particularly send them a donation. Do it now. Don't hesitate. And, uh, and if you want, you can endorse my uh, offer to the BBC to come on this show and explain why they think Scott should, uh, should trust them. I'd be delighted to prove wrong because uh, they haven't turned up so far, but uh, the, the welcome is there. Uh, you can help by getting on the case. Thank you again and good night. Join us next Wednesday. And remember, it's a great day for UK democracy. Good night all. Hello, my name's Steve B, and I'm a presenter on Indie Live Radio. I present music and musings every Friday night at 7. The music, that's 70s classic rock, although we will take the occasional side road. The musings, well, they're thoughts on Scottish independence, politics and world events from my viewpoint, which is that of a grumpy old man. So join me every Friday night at 7 on Indie Live Radio, a new voice for a new Scotland. Hi, I'm Fiona from Clackman and Show Women for Independence. Did you know we have a podcast on Indie Live Radio? goes out at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, repeated at 6 o'clock on a Thursday. Uh, come and join us for some news, views, opinions, the odd poem. It'd be very nice to have you with us. And come and hear the news you're not getting. Hear some new voices for a new Scotland at Indie Live Radio. Hi, James E here from the Saturday show on IndieLive.radio. We play a wide selection and wide genre of music for your entertainment. We're on Saturday mornings from 10 till 1 p.m. Remember, join us on IndieLive.radio, a new voice for a new Scotland. Hi, this is Marley, and I'm here to tell you a bit about Daytime Live show, which goes out Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays on Indie Live Radio at half past 11 for a couple of hours. So I present the programme along with Val and we are there with a variety of guests to chat to uh, each day. Now, at the moment, Wednesday's show is a catch-up edition. Uh, it's not live. What we do is we rebroadcast some of the more recent interviews. So we hope we enjoy all of those. Be there at half past 11 on Indie Live Radio for the news you don't hear elsewhere. A new voice for a new Scotland.
Westminster. No Westminster. Come on. No Westminster. Not for me. Not for me. Not there for I'll be your slave. Oh, oh, oh. 